This placid stretch of water, starred by a few white water lilies, is what's known in this part of the world as a billabong, from which you'll guess that we're in Australia. If you travel about 80 miles in that direction, you come to a small cattle station. But you'll have to travel for over 100 miles in pretty well any other direction before you'll find another white face. I asked one of the men in the cattle station what the country was like ahead, and he said, she's harsh. Well, she is harsh. Away from these lagoons and swamps, the country is dry and waterless, covered with nothing but gum trees and pandanus palms and hot, dry rock. Behind me, you can hear the voices of over a quarter of a million geese. And not just ordinary geese either, for those geese over there are among the rarest geese in the world. They're the magpie geese, and it's the magpie geese that have brought us here. Beyond these eucalyptus trees, the huge swamp begins that is the magpie geese's home. And on the edge of it, we've built a small hide. And during the past week or so, we've been sitting in that hide, watching the geese and the other enormous flocks of water birds that have come here during the dry season to feed. During much of the day, it's extremely difficult to get a clear view of the geese. For not only are they very nervous and easily scared, but most of them are way out in the middle of the swamps, feeding among the tall, reedy grass. And you can see little more of them than their heads and necks. But when they've finished feeding, some of them leave the swamps to preen and clean themselves. Then you can see how very different they are from normal geese. Their legs are unusually long, only half webbed, and with long claws. They have a hooked bill and a large knob on the top of their heads. In fact, they're so odd that some authorities have questioned whether they're really true geese at all. Their long legs and claws are of great help to them in feeding, for their favorite food is the bulbs of the plants which grow in these swamps. Elsewhere in Australia, they're extremely rare, but up here on the north coast, they still survive in vast numbers. A few years ago, attempts were made to grow rice on a large scale here, a little to the west. Hundreds of acres of land were cleared and sown. Millions of pounds were spent. The geese regarded this as a splendid increase in their feeding grounds. They descended on the fields in thousands. Nothing the cultivators could do would scare them off. Rattles, ingenious scarecrows of one sort and another were tried, but the area was too vast for them to be effective. Then the military were called in to keep up a regular fusillade of bullets over the swamps. They killed quite a lot of geese, but most of the flock simply flew off for half a mile or so and then settled down again out of range. Finally, the rice growers gave up. The enormous investment was written off and the rice growing project was abandoned. The geese had won. There are many other things to see here, as well as the magpie geese. In a few weeks' time, when the rains come, much of this country will be underwater and totally impassable. But just now, it's so dry that huge fires continually rage through the bush, clearing areas of grass and blackening the tree trunks. But even in such a scorched area as this, so recently swept by fire, there are still interesting creatures to be found. Just over there, I can see something that, that might look like a snake, but I'm fairly sure isn't. And that, I think, yes it is, it's it's a skink. A lot of people confuse the skink with the death adder and think it's poisonous and therefore kill it unnecessarily. But this isn't a snake at all. Its legs are very tiny. In fact, it's a lizard. And it's quite harmless. It 
they shouldn't give me any trouble at all uh, when it comes to picking them up. Now, the thing to do, although of course he's got a little of a bit of a bite and I don't want to be bitten, but the thing to do is just pick him up behind the back of the neck. Like so. <laughs> They're rather nice beast too. He's, oh, whoops. He's, ah, what a nice, he's got a blue tongue, hence his name, naturally, the blue tongue skink but a very nice creature. Actually, you don't have to come all the way up to Arnhem Land uh, to see uh, the blue tongue skink. It occurs all over Australia, even as far south as, uh, as Sydney. And it doesn't lay eggs, unlike many lizards. It gives birth to live young. And there it is, a rather fine example, whoops, of a blue tongue skink. And having seen him, well, let him go again and go on with our walkabout. Go on. But although all the country around here is so waterless and harsh, there are nonetheless a great number of very interesting animals to be seen. But you have to be pretty careful when you walk around in this sort of country, because around here, roaming among the gum trees, are over a quarter of a million water buffalo. They're not truly Australian animals. They come from Asia, but they were introduced here over a hundred years ago as beasts of burden. And since then, they've increased enormously in numbers, and they've gone wild. Indeed, they have the reputation of being extremely dangerous, even though they're supposed to be docile back in their true home in Asia. When we were in Darwin, the main town in the Northern Territories, people were continually telling us how dreadfully dangerous these things were. We met one man who had spent three hours up in a gum tree while an angry bull buffalo tried to knock him and the tree down. We met another man who had just come out of hospital after spending three weeks there with six broken ribs and a badly gored side, who had been just walking in the bush when, without notice, a bull buffalo charged him and knocked him down. He only got away by seizing the beast's huge horns and twisting his neck until he went away. We even heard of a woman who was knocked down and who got away by stroking the beast's muzzle and saying, there, there, old thing, it's all right, until eventually the beast went away. But even so, she was pretty badly hurt. So we felt that we had to get some pretty good advice on how we should behave in this sort of bush, just in case we did come across buffalo and they looked rather angry at us. And the best person, it seemed to us, to give us advice was Yorkie Billy. Yorkie's camp is just half a mile up the lagoon that way. And Yorkie has spent all his life as a buffalo hunter. Yorkie said that buffalo were very unpredictable beasts. Sometimes they would just walk away, but other times they charge without warning. I asked him how you could tell if one was likely to be dangerous. Oh, I can tell the way they stand up. They won't. They won't. They got a bad tempered look on them. <laughs> they, so I have to look at a buffalo and try and sort out at a distance of 100 yards whether he's got a bad tempered look. Yeah, that's the way. If, he, if he's got a very bad tempered look, don't go near him. How, how's close is it safe to approach? How close? Mm. Uh, we're in about 50 or 60 yards. Not closer than that? Not closer than that. And supposing, uh, what advice would you give me when I'm walking around this bush? You reckon it's safe for me to walk through the bush? Oh, it is safe, but be careful. See where you're going. Not, don't walk into, don't walk onto a sleeping buffalo while he's asleep or while he's feeding. Just, just... Uh, but that's all they do, sleep and feed. Oh, well, just go around them, basically. <laughs> <laughs> in, in particular, on walking along grass. No. That's where the buffaloes are keep to the on. I see. And uh, what happens if I see one who's looking bad-tempered and who moves towards me? What do I do then? Well, just keep away from him. 
Just walk away from him. Is he liable to charge? Yes, he'll charge. Can I dodge him? Or you could by getting up a tree or getting behind a tree or if you have a gun in your hand. Well, I don't carry a gun and I don't really like the look of these trees much because they haven't got any low branches to get up. Well, if he's charged you, there's another way of getting away from him. If he charged you and he's coming full gallop at you, just fall flat on the ground the buffalo will jump over you and gallop on. Will he? Yeah. I remember that. I shall probably pass out with fright. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I used to do when I was out in the plains. With no trees, within about one or two miles away. The tree, the nearest tree. That's what I used to do when I was charging buffalo. Fall flat on the ground, buffalo jump over me, charging buffalo. Have you been with buffalo all your life, working with buffalo? Oh, yes, been on buffalo jobs, cattle stations, driven, on railway jobs, working. But you used to shoot a lot of buffalo, didn't you? Oh, in the early days, when the price was good, the skins were worth 15 pounds. Up to nearly 20 pound hide for an old big bull. And how many would you shoot a year? Oh, perhaps a couple of thousand. According to the license, of, the license were issued to the buffalo shooters to, to shoot a couple of thousand a year. It's not worth shooting them now? No, not worth shooting them now. They, they protect it now. Yeah, but there's no price for the skins, I suppose. No price for the skins now. Yorkie, were you born here? Yes, born in this country, Jimson. In the gym gym. Mm. Who was your father, Yorkie? Uh, my father, he was from Yorkshire. His name was William Alderson, but they called him Yorkie Mick. Y Yorkie Nick. Mick? Yorkie Mick. Yeah. Because he came from Yorkshire? Yeah, nickname. Yeah. And uh, uh, my father was William Alderson, my name was William Alderson. Have you ever thought much about Yorkshire, Yorkie? Huh? Have you ever thought much about that place, Yorkshire? Never thought. Thought about what it's like? Oh, my father used to tell me what it's, what it's like. What do you reckon it's like? Snow country. Snow? Mm. Yeah. Everything gets snowed up. You get freaking everything. You have to be hand fed, cattle, stock, everything locked in the house. Yeah. And my father used to be a farmer in the Yorkshire, grow spuds and onions. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Where did you meet your wife, Yorkie? She, uh, she promised to me first, and when the father and mother who had no husband for my wife, he gave her, the father and mother gave them to me as a promise. What do you mean as a promise, Yorkie? A promise is a tribal promise. Mm -hmm. It says uh, it's a sort of a tribal law. It's, it's from the uh, tribal affairs, and they give promises a promise. You give this wife over to this man, it's your wife, they tell him, yeah. forever. Well, when, when do you make this promise? I mean, how old would be... Uh, the girl when oh, they make a before they're born. Before they're born? Yes, yeah, before they're born. If they promise if if a man by tribal affairs and natives, if they got a auntie or a cousin, mm. well that 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 woman will say now the first child born, if it's a if it's a girl, if it's female or male, it's yours. If it's female. Yeah. That promise don't break. How many children have you got, Yorkie? I got five. Uh, two sons and three daughters. And who looked after your wife at the birth? Oh, I attended the birth myself. Did you? Mm, too far away from the doctor. Oh, bad. Yeah. Mm, bad luck. So you must know a fair bit about midwifery. Oh, yes, a <laughs> bit of midwife. <laughs> yes, as well as everything else. <laughs> Yorkie, uh, this sort of country, uh, is it pretty rich in animals? Rich for in animals. In animals. Mm. Yes, it is rich in animals all over this country. What sort of things can we can we can we see dingoes here? Oh, you see dingoes, but you'd have to look for them. They're pretty rare now, are they? Yes, they're pretty scarce around this country now. Uh, lots of years they've been dying out, one thing or another, drought, no water. You've been years. shooting them. No. Huh? You've been shooting them too. Oh, sometimes I do for yeah. a living. Because there's a reward, isn't there, for a dingo? There's a reward, yeah. a, a bonus for uh, a quid. A quid for a dingo? Mm. Yorkie is not the only man who makes his living from the wild animals. Other people wandering in the bush depend on them for food, the aborigines. These are their graves. The tribes of this part of the north coast are very different from the people of the central desert. No other Australian people erect monuments comparable to these huge sculptures hewn from tree trunks and decorated in brilliant colours. 
Perhaps the inspiration for them came from outside Australia. For seamen in canoes and prows have for centuries been visiting this coast from the islands of Indonesia in the west or New Guinea in the north. Not only do these Aborigines carve and paint, but they're also extremely gifted dancers. They dance as part of their sacred rituals, but they also dance for fun and entertainment because they enjoy doing so. These play-about dances they call yois, and often in them they enact the story of a hunt. This is the kangaroo yoi, a mimed drama portraying the killing of a kangaroo. It's full not only of suspense, but of comedy. Their most skillful dancer, whose talent for realistic mime and unpredictable humour is keenly appreciated by the audience, plays the part of one of the kangaroos that eventually will be slain by the hunters. His hair is dyed bright red with henna, and slung round his neck, he wears an ornamental ball of goose feathers. <laughs> the kangaroos are squabbling among themselves and grazing, for as yet, the hunters have not appeared. These people hunt not only kangaroos, but also magpie geese. The approach to the swamps through the mangroves must be made in complete silence and with great caution. For if one bird is frightened and flies off, the whole flock will take to the air. And pelicans are more efficient sentinels than most. The hunter uses a spear thrower to give additional force to his spear. One plump goose lying in the now deserted waters of the swamp. A goose that will provide a good meal for a complete family. We too spent a great deal of time wandering in the bush that fringes the swamps, trying to catch sight of the other creatures that are attracted here by the open water. Our attention was caught by these little pygmy geese. I glanced up and there on the opposite bank stood a dingo. This was a real stroke of luck, for after all, Yorkie had been very doubtful of our chances of seeing one. We stood stock still while he stared fixedly in our direction. Whether he was looking at us or the birds on the lagoon, I didn't know. 
It was fortunate for him that Yorkie was not with us, for if he had been, the dingo would not have been able to trot away like this. The dingo is something of a mystery. He was certainly here long before Europeans came to Australia. It's thought that he arrived in the canoes of the ancestors of the Aborigines when they first came to this country thousands of years ago. But exactly where his original home was, no one knows. But we had still failed to find our main quarry, the buffalo. This egret, standing on the edge of the swamp, however, was a good sign, for egrets spent a great deal of their time around the buffalo herds, collecting the insects thrown up by the buffalo's hooves and picking ticks and flies from their hides. And there they were, far out in the swamps, wading up to their knees in water, with egrets riding on their backs. They were nearly a quarter of a mile away, and we were filming them with telephoto lenses, so there was no danger of being charged. But on the other hand, our view of them was not a very good one, for the heat was so intense that the air over the swamps quivered and danced, and we couldn't get any closer to them across the swamps, even if we'd wanted to. Everywhere they went, the egrets followed them. The cattle egret is really a bird of Africa and Asia, and no one quite knows when or how it got to Australia. As it occurs nowhere else in the world except in association with cattle of one sort or another, it's unlikely that it got here before the buffalo, and they've only been here for about a hundred years. Some 30 years ago, no one had recorded a cattle egret in Australia. In fact, an attempt was made to introduce them into Western Australia in the hope that they would clear the local cattle of ticks. 18 birds were imported, but they all died, and it was thought that the experiment was a failure. Then a naturalist suddenly discovered that there were great flocks of egrets up here in the Northern Territory. Were they descendants of the original introduction, or had they got here by themselves by way of the Indonesian islands? No one knows. As the heat became more intense, the buffaloes began to wander off into the bush. The only way to get a better view of them was obviously to follow them. The herd was scattered throughout the trees. Every time I saw one, I remembered what Yorkie had said, and I must admit, I found it very difficult to decide whether they had a bad or a good-tempered look on them. All of them looked rather surly to me, but none of them stayed long. This was the nearest we had approached to one so far. He was a big old bull, and he snuffed our scent rather alarmingly. Then he was off. But he didn't go far. His faithful egret settled once more on his back, and then he began to circle us at a distance of about 20 yards. What did he want? he was certainly well aware of our presence. Was he one of the peaceful ones, or one of those that Yorkie had called cranky and bad-tempered? Well, if he did charge, we would be fairly safe in this sort of country, for there were more than enough trees to dodge behind or to shin up. Slowly and disdainfully, he walked around us, and eventually he just stalked away. But we still wanted to see the large groups of buffalo that we had heard about, and the place to do that was not in the bush. Out here on the open plains, we should be seeing big herds of buffalo. 
Whereas it was hot enough in there, though, in the shade of the gums, out here it really is baking hot. The sun's beating down on these flat open plains. And if I'd been a traveller walking for perhaps a week with very little water, well, I should be looking over there, and I should think probably that that was a wide, cool lagoon full of water with trees mirrored in its surface. In fact, it's nothing of the kind. It's a mirage, an optical illusion caused by this great burning, beating heat. And over there, there's nothing but scorched mud, and there's no water and no trees. But there are the buffalo. A herd several hundred strong, a really impressive sight. They had gathered around the last shrinking water hole on the plains to drink and to wallow in the mud. Approaching these was going to be a little more difficult. Slowly, we advanced towards them until we were close enough to get a really good view of the cows with their calves. They looked amiable enough, and we went a bit closer. Here, too, they were tended by birds, though not by cattle egrets, by pied herons. But then they decided that we had come rather too close for their liking, and a large group of them advanced towards us rather threateningly. There were no trees to shin up out here. If they charged, the only thing to do would be to take Yorker's advice and fall flat on our faces. By and large, it seemed better to take the offensive ourselves. So maybe the buffalo is not so dangerous after all, provided that you can see him in good time and he can see you.